Um, okay, this I just, I, I had to share with you guys, honestly. Um, this is a, a news from the news site news site that will publish anything and will stretch the truth to its maximum uh but you can always count on the fact that they will publish any salacious nonsense and this is of course the daily mail uh here here we'll, we'll, we'll source it not that i need to promote this trash news um okay Russian conscripts are being given 19th century rifles made to drink from ponds filled with dead frogs due to lack of supplies in order to run in front of enemy soldiers to draw their fire, they reveal. Now, this is a classic Daily Mail move. Yeah, uh, because right here it says Russian conscripts. Next, it says six Donbas region conscripts, right? Their partners or friends have told of conditions. Uh, so the Donbas region, uh, there's, it's called the DNR, um, and they are a separatist, um, uh, they're the separatist regions in Eastern Ukraine, and they have been fighting against the, you know, rest of Ukraine for a long time. Now they're Russian backed, so heavily Russian backed that they're functionally treated as Russian proxies, um. Yeah, and the DNR and LPR. Oh, I thought it was LNR. Um, yeah, so they, they are... So these regions are extremely impoverished, uh, and it's gotten way worse since, obviously, they became separatists. They're sort of like the Rust Belt of Ukraine, is my understanding. Um, and then they are, like when they separated right obviously ukraine was like we're not going to provide this separatist region with utilities or water or anything and so russia has basically had to like supply water and food imports into the region it's economically like been pretty devastated by this separatist movement um and so yeah they have an armed force a military that that is like drafting people to the fight um, but generally, they use almost exclusively Russian military surplus gear because obviously their patron state, Russia, that's what it's going to give them. The fact that they've continued to fight uh, for as many years as they have, even as the Ukrainian military gets more and more competent, is a testament to the fact that for many years, Russia would just send like their first rate troops there. Uh, for example, there was one video that talked about how Russian troops would uh they're finishing their final exam at their artillery academy was actually to go and su support the dnr lnr operations um uh by actually like running live fire missions all this to say yes the russians consider as as um icarus points out the Russians consider them Russians, uh, and so much so that Russia has issued them, I think, Russian passports. And the, um, the uh, of course, the Ukrainians are like, no, these are our citizens. They're born in our territory. Just because they speak another language doesn't mean that they are your citizens, right? It's sort of the equivalent of being like an American-born person who speaks spanish is is like actually mexican it's like no man once you're born on u.s soil like you're a citizen you know um so yeah so calling them russian i don't know that's probably just the daily mail being lazy um and trying to be clickbaity it's not really i, I don't think they're like implying like wink wink like oh they're really russian so anyway let's see uh one person one student said he was forced to drink water from a fetid pond. And another said he was told to repel Ukrainian forces, having never been trained to fire an automatic weapon. Some draftees have been given a Mosin, a World War II rifle. The wives of conscripts said their partners had no combat experience. Well, no shit. And all said there was a severe lack of supplies. Yeah, drinking out of a pond is dangerous for a bunch of reasons. But let's see. Uh, okay. No lack of food and water, inadequate equipment, those armies, right? One of the soldiers conscripted in late February said a fellow fighter told him to repel a close quarter attack by Ukraine forces in southwest Donbass, but said, 
I don't even know how to fire an automatic weapon. That's bad. Um, yikes. Uh, the student and his unit fired back and evaded capture, but he was later injured in battle. Um, at one point he said he was forced to drink water from a fetid pond full of dead frogs because of a lack of supplies. Uh, other sources and kind of draftees said the men had to drink untreated water. Okay, so what he's probably describing is the fact that, yeah, supplies in these territories are really, really, really hard to come by. Um, and you can imagine if the primary Russian military is having supply issues, you know that these separatist forces who are cons separatist militia are going to have even more supply issues. It's going to be pretty bad. Now, it's pretty screwed up that you have to drink water from a pond, uh, but there are ways to do it, right? So it, when we had the Russian MRE, the Russian ration, uh, inside were actually water purification tablets. So it's possible to just, if you can just filter out the water and then run the water purification tablets, it will at least neutralize any diseases. I think their fear with the dead frogs was that there was a, a, a chemical contaminant in the water that had killed the frog. Something had leaked. Um, that's, it, yeah, that unfortunately water purification tablets or a um a water filter like a camping water filter isn't going to do anything about those um yeah uh when my wife and i camp uh and backpack we both carry uh sawyer mini filters and they are excellent um from ponds streams anything that doesn't have much like debris in it um, you're going to be able to get some water and filter. In fact, there was one time we were in um, Bryce Canyon and we actually, uh, the only spring, and it was like over 100 degrees out and we had been hiking for like 17 miles. Um, and so we finally get to what's supposed to be a spring and it's just like a mud pool. It's like an iron rich pool of mud. And so literally I have to like, kind of wade into it balance on rocks scoop out a part of the mud so that there's a little pool a little bit of like water flow and then literally like a three or four ounces at a time i'm able to scoop this water and run it through the filter and it's so iron rich that even when it passes through the filter it retains a red tint uh it is like ultra dilute kool-aid it was so weird and it took us like two hours because we had a gallon each that we had already drank through um yeah it's funny czar wolf is like you should make videos on camping and outdoor stuff i used to uh and the videos did not get a ton of traction though i wonder now i i think sometimes that like i've learned a lot about how to make a, a a fun catchy video and marketing and obviously i have an audience now i think it might be cool i think about that sometimes um or to do like military applicable real world skills like land navigation um yeah i may try it i may i may i may take a stab at it you know thanks alex alex says they would for sure do better um yeah so anyway the point is is that there's ways to do it and even if you don't have a filter the easiest way and this is actually uh i have a russian military surplus um uh canteen that has directions that came with little directions that explain that the canteen itself can be used to, to boil water so if you can get the water to boil um that'll kill off any bacteria again won't do anything for chemicals or dissolved minerals or anything like that um but it will get that water out of there what you can do if you really want to get out uh impure dissolved impurities you can actually run like a still basically where you vaporize boil the water off so it vaporizes have the vapor pass through like a tube and then enter a cooler area where it condenses again and it'll fill up slowly but you'll get you'll get pure drinkable water. And um, so 
Oh yeah, De Dec Decimus asks, land navigation would be a good one. A lot of my friends are amazed when I'm able to use a map and navigate a to encompass to navigate through land. It's true, it's a perishable skill. Um so anyway, the, you can get purified water as long as you have time to boil it and make a fire. What I'm imagining is these people were probably given like a few minutes to refill their canteens from a lake and then told to uh uh, told to like get get back on the march reposition right so they didn't have time to build a fire and purify it or maybe they could have and they just didn't translate or it's not very clickbaity to be like we boiled water made it safe and drank from it you know um okay so let's take a look at these these actual pictures right uh all right so here's a guy let's see can we open this image in a new tab Better, better. Okay, let's uh, let's see if we can get this. There we go. There we go. Is this nerd? Okay, let's take a look at what he's got. So he has no body armor, uh, which is problematic, and then he is literally being issued like standard Cold War Soviet conscript gear that would probably be familiar to a uh World War Two conscript. So you have a Mosin, and this is actually a PU sniper because has the downturned bolt. You can see it has the original scope and even leather uh, lens protectors, right? So this is something straight out of World War II. Um, yeah, there are there sights? Uh, yes, there's the iron front sight and the rear sight, I think, is back there. Uh, no, it would be right here, right where he's holding it. Uh, but no, it's got a scope. It's a sniper rifle, so it's, it's probably fairly accurate. Um, at least the, the the Mosins that became converted to sniper rifles were selected for their accuracy. What I find fascinating is that here you have a Soviet conscripts belt, and I actually have a belt buckle. Let me grab it real quick. Yeah, I have a belt, a Soviet belt buckle from Afghanistan. Let's uh make me big again uh yeah so this is this is from afghanistan this is a from a captured soviet soldier um the the rumor the myth of uh Afga in afghanistan was that the cia used to pay uh mujahideen fighters uh kill bounties based on the number of soviet belt buckles they brought back so our wolf asked if dragon arms were in the cold war they were um yeah, he does look sad to be carrying this. He also, interestingly, has what looks like um, a knapsack or haversack or even a butt pouch back here that may also be a canteen, uh, like a canteen storage um, uh, pouch. But let's see if we have more. Okay, here's another. Here's another. It looks like a screen cap of once again a sniper variant of the Mosin. Okay, so again, it's it's the Mosins basically never stopped being in used in conflicts since probably the so since it was invented. Um, okay, here's what's really interesting though. There's some other interesting gear here. So this this canvas thing, this is a posh palatka. This is a tent slash raincoat um, that they can carry. Uh, that again from the Second World War, and it's really, really versatile. Um, we take it every time we go camping. Sometimes it's a ground cloth. Sometimes it's a, it's a. We use it to like cover our packs when we think it could get rain um, overnight. So, yeah. And uh, you also have what's interesting, the Veshmashak. And a Veshmashak is a really cheap, like incredibly cheap to manufacture uh, backpack uh, from the actually the First World War. And th what's fascinating about it is that the top of the sack is closed basically with a knot and the two ends of the knot form the shoulder straps. So if you take it off, you have to actually untie like you can't just zip it up, zip it on. You can't get at your buddies. The shoulder straps tie it closed. And the reason it's so cheap is because it 
it, it uses very little metal to manufacture. Um, you know, if again, not a big concern now, but in World War II and World War One, manufactured like metal components were rare and hard to get. So being able to do everything with just generic tough kind of denim cloth was actually a really really like valuable trait um what's interesting is that a lot of these guys look like they have ak looks like i'm trying to see the gas blocks here uh looks like they're probably 74s but I'm, i am seeing a lot of mosins i'm trying to tell what these are if these are like covers for the front of the rifle because this is an ak oh oh they're being issued i think with bayonets okay yeah this isn't this is not a mosin this isn't these are all ak's i think the guys issued mosins are gonna be like um the the guys with the mosins are like designated marksmen they're gonna be in like a sniper role i think or, yeah, Mackerel Dude points out, or Rear Echelon. Yeah, I think, I mean, a smarter army would be using these guys not as cannon fodder, but as rear area. So, for example, guarding supply lines, guarding depots, running checkpoints, right? Those are all roles that that you could probably do them with a Mosin, especially things like checkpoints, crowd control, that sort of stuff. Yeah, I have yet to see a Mosin that wasn't a sniper variant. Let's see what else we got. This is just a map upgrade. Okay, let's see. Yep, there's what looks like bayonet. Let's see. Yeah, it looks like a bayonet attached with like a cover on it. Um, but yeah, let's see. Look, you can see these guys have extremely standard issue um, Soviet gear. There's their belt. There's like a haversack or bread. They call them like a bread pouch. Um... AI space destructor says crowd control works good if a bayonet is attached to it. You can actually do a, a basic type of crowd control is when you stand your soldiers online and you literally face the bayonets out so that you form like a wall of, of sharp steel and then you just step forward in, in unison one at a time. It kind of helps you like clear out, um, say for example, a square of protesters or something. Um, when I was in Afghanistan, I had uh, your M4 had standard iron sights and then an ACOG mounted on it. So the the rails had an ACOG, and that's what that's what we were like trained with. Um, yeah. So the separatist announced in late February they'd be drafting all fighting age men for immediate deployment. Uh, so yeah, interesting. And Putin ordered the invasion of Ukraine February twenty fourth. So that is interesting. Um, yeah, so anyway, these guys looking, looking not, not that ready. Okay, uh, here's another picture. Let's see if we can do a gear breakdown. Yep, like we talked about, you can see not all of them have a Veshma shock, but all of them appear to have, like, the belt and then a, a, a gear bag, right? Um, this looks like actually the bag for a PKM, uh, magazine, and you can see he's showing how to, it looks like how to do maintenance on a Mosin sniper. So yeah, yeah, that's what I'm seeing here. These guys are getting uh, just a standard sort of crash course. Uh, probably this is probably like their basic training, right? They're issued this gear. They are told this is their uniform and then they're learning how to use their standard issue weapons. Yeah, this is, someone points out, um, they really are. This is this is definitely a People's Republic type of military or militia. But again, it, sometimes you have to be like, the, if the unit is equipped and trained for the job it has to do, then it's then you're you're good to go, right? So you definitely will have this like, you know, again, if these guys, if you told me they were going to do like rear area security, law enforcement, or they were going to drive supply trucks from a depot to a f more forward depot um this this would all be perfectly adequate for them right this would be a perfectly adequate level of training 
Uh, obviously, yeah, you want to have a basic com set of combat skills. Um, but what you don't want to do is be put in in uh, fight fights against a properly equipped force. Right, an old gun can still kill someone. Flight of Icarus points out, and he's he's absolutely correct. What else do we got? Okay, and then we got these guys. Russian conscripts say they've been thrown into the shit. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it. Those guys are having a hard time with things. Let's see. I wonder if we can see the dates here. Uh, I can't. I can't tell. I don't know the nomenclature. Anyway, guys, that's that's these poor guys having not a great time. Not a great time to be a conscript. I mean, is there ever a good time to be a conscript? Um, but definitely Russia seems to be... You, I mean, it's tough to tell, right? They seem to be willing to abuse these sort of low-level conscripts um, much more than in the U.S., where, you know, we we would sit there and just be like, hey, listen, the, the, if you're not trained for this, like, we don't want you here. Like, we, we need highly trained units doing the fighting, but, like, our lesser trained units generally don't have those sort of assignments. Uh Though I say that, I know a lot of Reserve and National Guard units, a lot, that uh, had true combat assignments. Um, and it, that, that can be problematic. There are some National Guard units that are as good as their active duty counterparts because what they lack in, like, training hours they make up for in like personnel stability. And here's what I mean. Uh, so let's say you're a National Guard infantry company. You might have a company commander who's been there four years. Your first sergeant might have been in the unit for 10 years. Your squad leaders might have been squad leaders for five years or more. Your team leads might be team leads for, again, five years. You have many privates and specialists are experienced senior soldiers who just say, hey, listen, I have a really demanding civilian career. I don't want to get promoted, but I want to serve my country. I don't want a promotion to sergeant. But so you, I've seen it. Units where you you have like a squad leader or a specialist who's just like, specialist is like, yeah, I've been a specialist seven years. Um, you know, I did the sniper's course and then I took a mortar course and uh you know i've i've you know done four ntc rotations and they're just like every single individual soldier skill they're like a 10 out of 10 and they're just like i just don't i just don't want to be a sergeant i don't want that responsibility and so you know in an active duty infantry company almost no one will have been in that company for more than i'm gonna say three years um, and almost no one will have been in their current role for more than four. So I would say that um, yeah, I would say that in the US, especially some good good reserve units and National Guard units can I would definitely rate as being on par with profession like like active duty units but the worst of the national guard is so bad it's so bad it's crazy crazy how just like underperforming uh they can be and right and like it's hard it's hard for the big army like you can interact with a unit and you'll know pretty quickly whether or not they are like professionals who are here to do work or if they're like, mm, if there's certain work that might be more right for them, right? But the big army doesn't know that. They just know, hey, this unit's passed its training. This unit has all its personnel. It's deployment ready. On reserve units, though, they also have a 90-day additional train-up where they're on active duty and they're due to deploy, but they get 90 days of... Um, training so that they can get the same sort of unit level um, uh, exercises and training events that their active duty counterparts get. So all that to say 
that the DNR, LNR, right, they treat the D DPR, DL, L, LPR, or whatever, um, they treat, they're treating their militias way differently than we would treat our reserve elements. Again, a, 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 a militia is not going to get treated like a reserve unit. It just isn't, right? Um, another example is that every National Guard soldier, right, and every reserve soldier, they go through side by side the same basic training as their active duty counterparts. Um, so they all have the exact same training. Um, I it's, Some other stuff is truncated a little bit. Like I had a truncated captain's career course because I did it through the reserve component. But um, so it was still like six months, but it was a the work was partially like computer based stuff. And then there was two two week courses of the actual in in classroom in field stuff. So anyway, point is uh, the U.S. treats its reserve elements much differently, much, much differently than uh, Russia appears to be treating its reserve elements. So. Yeah, Desmus points out that there was a, I guess, Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic also had a volunteer military um, and then switched over to a professional military that's smaller but much more capable. And the truth is a lot of modern militaries, their whole national defense scheme is basically to maintain a professional military that can do two things. One, fight a delaying operation against an enemy. And two, become the core training cadre of a conscript army that will fight. So basically, it would be sort of like if Russia was to start massing in Ukraine, they would call, you know, a, a country with this sort of um, defense plan would either do a mass conscription or a mass like activation of reservists. And the active duty military would basically probably get cut in half or and half would literally just become trainers and operators and like unit leaders and they would get dispersed into all these new units to help train them up and build up their proficiency so i said no 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 it was supposed to be my pants i killed what did you do to me i killed i know